Hi, Jim. Hey, Bob. How you doing? Should be here almost. Almost. In fact, you know, before uh, before I called you, I was uh, I wanted to see if there's anything big has changed in your life, so I Googled you, and I, I got to your Wikipedia entry, and it says. He appears frequently on Blogging Heads TV. Well, not frequently enough, Jim Pinkerton. We're going to have to either edit that entry or you're going to have to change a few things. We can do this the easy way or the hard way. I, I get it. I get it. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. <laughs> and you've seen me do things the hard way. In fact, you might say all my life. Never mind. Um, so this is a, kind of a year-end uh, retrospective, prospective, contemplative kind of thing. Okay. And uh, normally, at some point in a conversation with you, you go into apocalyptic mode. Mm. Should we just start with that? Uh, should we start? Uh, right. Uh, well, um, I don't know. Uh, uh, hmm. Gee, that's a hard question. Uh, um... <laughs> I'll move on to the next one then. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How about the Redskins? No, yeah. Um, I... On Fox I, News, you're a Fox News contributor, I should say, and and they don't they don't like throw curveballs like that at you, right? That was, that only yeah, happens on Blogging they, Heads. They they right, they they usually right. Uh, I, look, I think many things are going well and many things are going badly. I think probably the biggest news of the year, in terms of what we'll remember, is the rise of the rise of of an, an assertive China. Uh, ah, an assertive China. Right. If you think about all the American wars that got started uh, with naval incidents from the War of 1812 mm -hmm. to the Spanish-American War to World War I, from an American point of view being Lusitania, from World War II, of course, Pearl Harbor, and of course, uh, Vietnam, mm -hmm. the Tonkin Gulf incident, um, it, the news that a, an American and Chinese ship nearly collided uh, like on December 5th uh, is not small. Uh, the Chinese are what's known as a revisionist power, and um, they fully intend to overcome the deficit they fell into over the last 500 years. Um, I don't blame them for feeling that way, um, but I think it's full of implications for uh, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, and frankly, the United States. Possibly apocalyptic ones, it sounds. Uh, oh yeah, I mean, uh, uh, this is how war, this is how wars begin, mm -hmm. and I, I don't think that we're a, 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 mentally, mentally and psychologically. Um, you know, I don't think we're ready for it. And I think actually, you know, because, you know, the other, the other thing I always bring up in every blogging heads with you is not only apocalypticism, but also the, the great book Non-Zero. Um, so I, I will say I, I in, in defiance of the, that book, which told us that Bill Clinton would bring in. Nirvana. Oh, give me a break. <laughs> it was by the time it was anyway. So, I mean, I, I don't actually think the world is moving toward cooperation and harmony and peace and understanding in the age of Aquarius or anything. Um, I think. Parts are, parts are going really well, and I think there's some really scary stuff, of, of, of which probably in the same way that, you know, the, the, the various incidents like the Al Jazeera incident in, I think, Morocco in 1911 uh, between uh, Germany and France or whoever, whoever it was. But it was one of those incidents that people said, look back at at the time, seemed like, well, it's just a little imperial incident on the, on the periphery somewhere. But in fact, it turned out to be a big deal as the origins of World War I. Okay, well. Laudably, I will only spend a little bit of time correcting your, your characterization of my book, Non-Zero. It does not say the world is inevitably moving towards nirvana. It says there is the very real chance of us screwing it up as we approach the global level of social organization. Uh, but but th th therefore, the title was misleading. Is that what you're saying? No, no. We are more and more playing non-zero-sum games, but non-zero-sum games can be played to a lose-lose outcome. Okay. What, so, what, what is, so it's, it's non-zero unless it's zero. No, no. It's non. It, it, it's it's still non-zero if it's lose-lose. That is a, that is a lose a lose-lose outcome to a non-zero sum game. The sum does not equal zero. A win-win outcome. The sum does not equal zero. That's why it's a non-zero sum game. So that I guess that the title then non-zero completely summed up all the nuances that you wanted to get across. <laughs> Titles do that, don't they? <laughs> <clears throat> <laughs> okay, uh, I, I feel like I, I checked that box. We're good. Right. Yeah. So anyway, uh, you know, I, I share some of your concern about the possibility of some little dispute over some little island uh, getting big. But first of all, let me be clear. I mean, you're, you're not saying that China's behaving in an especially unusual way. It's, it's a rising power, as the United States was once. And you may notice that the United, there are legacies of the U.S.'s intervention 
much farther away from American shores and much closer to China, by the way, than, than any of the things we're talking about in China. Right? I mean, China's talking about disputed territory very close to it. There's the Taiwan issue uh, and and there's Tibet. The I, 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 the uh, I mean, these things are uh, let me put it this way. You don't think of China as a kind of endlessly expansionist power, right? You, you, you see it as carving out the kind of sphere of influence that rising powers try to carve out. I think they're probably endlessly expansionist. I think that endlessly uh, they would attack America if they could. In the, same, the same way that we're the same that way we were endlessly expansionist, or the same way that Great Britain was endlessly expansionist, mm-hmm. or the same way that Rome Rome was. You you endlessly as you rise in power and wealth, you expand until somebody stops you, uh, uh, and that's sort of the way of the world. I mean, what we ha- we haven't had before, the Chinese have been a leading civilization for as long as there's been civilizations, right? They they were they're the leading inventing country. For, for most of human history or civilization, what they lacked was a, a sense of empowering their own middle class, such as, I mean, we're talking peasants now, peasants and workers. And so the, the, the and, and, and not just empowering for the sake of being politically nice, but empowering in the sense of mass production and economics, economics of, of scale. So they invented gunpowder and the compass and paper and printing and all these things. And it never really occurred to the confusion aristocrat bureaucrats running the place that there's any real need to share that with the masses or in any way mass produce them. So they, they, therefore they, they it had all the stuff and the, and the, and the emperor and his little concubines and minions would sit there and admire this little skyrocket going off. It took the Europeans who, who were lagging behind them, but were nonetheless not stupid to, Hey, wait a second, we could, could make a cannon out of this. We could do, we could make, you know, weapons out of this. And of course, beginning the 16th century, they overwhelmed China. Only in the last few decades have the Chinese really began to think, well, not only are we smart, but we're also going to mass produce this stuff. I mean, Chairman Mao was sort of a hybrid figure. On the one hand, he was, you know, was that perfectly able and anxious to lord it over the peasants just with, with his own Chinese bureaucracy, you know, just as the Confucius had been doing for the thousand years before that. But he did build an A-bomb. He wasn't dumb. He did have a sense of, you know, world power and, and knew that nuclear weapons were part of it. Um, in the last couple decades, or three, de- three decades or so, the Chinese said, not only are we going to be smart, but we're also going to be mass producers. And that's something the world just hasn't seen well, uh, uh, ever. You know, I'm not, I'm not so sure they would have minded being mass producers before. What happened was they finally adopted a kind of variant of capitalism. They adopted a much more market-oriented economy, so they started succeeding at mass producing a lot of, you know, the reforms of Deng Xiaoping. I think to a large extent, the reason they are increasingly seen as a rival and have the material resources to be seen that way is because they have adopted a certain amount of what you could call the American way, certainly in the right. economic sphere. It's a more statist capitalism for the time being. Even it's, that is changing. But anyway, that, I, it's, it's the industrial way. What they, what they adopted was the right. mass. Look, the, the, the emperor in 1000 AD or, you know, 1500 AD, whoever he, he was, was not thinking about industrial development and the way say francis bacon was um in 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 europe the way colbert was in france and this is jean jean baptiste colbert in the 17th century they or, or henry clay in the 19th century they weren't thinking that way and that was why they that was why they were defeated now they are thinking that way and i really again i just don't i think we've got a you know a few hundred three thousand years ahead of us where a really really smart civilization with really really big ambitions and a strong sense of industrial wherewithal, including not just making toys, but you know, leading the world on supercomputers and uh, uh, you know, all yeah. sorts of other kinds of technologies. I don't. I think but we're in I, for a hell of a ride. I think the hope is lies in the fact that uh, I don't think China wants anything to spoil its uh, economic progress. First of all, in fact. Uh, you know, the government is very nervous because it wants to remain a one-party system and it sees that the citizenry more and more kind of has the power to protest, which it actually does a lot of. Um, and and so the government is very concerned with maintaining economic growth, bringing more and more people into uh, the middle class. And I, I don't think it wants to really disrupt that. I've seen no signs that China like wants an actual war. You you have a it currently has a premier who's kind of playing the nationalist card uh, with respect to these islands. And by the way, I gather that the the, the question over who's who who the islands rightfully are, uh, belong to is actually kind of complicated. They're not they're not inventing the controversy. Um, but uh, 
but I, I, in my my sense is that China fundamentally wants stability. So, how, do you know, how do you know that? That's just the way they behave. Uh, well, it's not, it's not they, don't, they don't. Who, Jim, Jim, who goes around? Here's a multiple choice question: Who goes around invading countries, America or China? I said, Bob, that's my point. A, a country that gets rich and powerful, it's, it climbs its Maslowian hierarchy beyond, well beyond food, shelter, and prosperity into self-actualization. So, yes, we have, self, we have self-actualized our way to the point <clears throat> where we, the Americans, say, oh, yes, we have to worry about human rights in Afghanistan and Iraq and Tibet and everywhere else and, and the rainforest and CO2 level in, in 100 years. We, right, we, we, have, we have achieved infinite ambitions as a nation based on prosperity. And now we're going to wake up and discover that another country has equally infinite ambitions based on prosperity. I guarantee that 20 years from now, if China continues at, at anywhere near the growth rate they are, we're going to be, there, there, there's going to be some hate crime against a Chinese American. And the Chinese government's going to call up the U.S. ambassador and say, look, what are you going to do about this? You, you know, some, some, some Chinese American got hurt or killed or wounded or something in somewhere. I, I just think there's no... There's, every reason of human nature to assume that they will have all the ambitions that we have. Well, I, and, and and if you, by the way, if you go to China and you watch, you turn on the TV, all you see are is movies about the, the, the Chinese uh, Japanese war yeah. of thirties and forties. And, they, 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 and for, for the reasons you said, they've got a one party system that's struggling for legitimacy. The, the, the best guarantor of legitimacy for a government is Foreign crisis, uh, yeah. even, including foreign wars. I mean, I, I mean, I, 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 nobody needs the Chinese communists to manage the economy. We agree on that. Well, they can they can do that with a kind of state capitalism cartel model. But you do need a government for is to lead us to victory against the 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 the, the enemy. Um, well, and, yeah, although tension is enough for you know, I mean, playing the nationalist card is indeed valuable politically. And unfortunately, we have a leader in both Japan and China right now who who doesn't mind doing that. But. Um, the, the tension is enough. You don't need the actual war. Right? <laughs> so look, the Kaiser, the Kaiser, the Kaiser, and Clemens, uh, Poincaré, and the Tsar, and the Emperor Ferdinand, or whoever they were in in World War One, they, they felt the same way. They didn't want a war. They didn't want a general war. They wanted to win the point against Serbia over the assassination of the Archduke Duke yeah, well. Ferdinand. And the, the, the South didn't want a war against the Union. It just wanted to secede quietly. Well, I, I agree with what I think you're saying is that war is most likely to come from what, you know, in effect is almost a miscalculation. Not, right. not, not China's aspiration to invade major countries. So, but anyway, what would you do? What would you advise? Is there anything you would advise American policymakers to do? Sure. Uh, prepare. <laughs> yeah, prepare, build weapons. And, 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 look, I think we have two choices. One is we either have to fundamentally and profoundly rethink the, the nature of our commitment to, say, Taiwan mm-hmm. uh, uh, and the Senkaku Islands and quite possibly South Korea and Japan. Either we rethink that or we better prepare in a big, and I do mean big way. Well, I think Taiwan's very different from Japan and South Korea. China's not going to invade Japan or South Korea. The way they would get into a war with is some dispute over, you know, miscalculation in this island dispute. Whereas Taiwan, they want to be theirs. That's an important part of their national self-conception. Uh, but what if, what if there's a compromise? We agree on Taiwan. What if, the, what, if the Jap, what if the Chinese say one day, look, we think we should have a, a, a naval base in Japan? Would that, would that, that would certainly say the Americans have one. Why shouldn't we have one too? And Japan says no. You think China's going to invade to get it? Come on. And then, then the then the Chinese say, you know, gosh, it would be a shame if your entire uh, electrical infrastructure internet grid uh, went out because uh, we have. I think you're. I th- there there we do disagree about how how things could, bad things could happen. That's not going to happen. Okay. Well, we'll we'll, we'll revisit see. The- well, right. Well, let's let's just let, who knows what will happen when. But in ten years, I guarantee if if things if if we continue to perfect our skills at fighting global warming and com- combating homophobia and patriarchy, and the Chinese continue to perfect their skills at dis- at at stealing all our technology, um, I think this this conversation will seem a lot more relevant. Okay, we face a problem here, Jim, which is, and I hadn't thought this through. I admit, when I asked you to go apocalyptic on us, if we do the apocalypse at the beginning of our discussion, the rest is kind of an anticlimax, <laughs> right? I mean, so aren't there other? That's what editing's for. Aren't there other apocalypses you can point to? <laughs> the, the Middle East ain't looking too stable. I'll tell yeah. you, I, th- here we disagree. I think the Middle East 
is a more likely uh, tinderbox. In fact, he's already gotten beyond the tinderbox stage, I would say, but uh, a more likely source of trouble than China. Why? You, you, I don't agree. Why? You don't agree? No. Where do I begin? Okay. Um, well, first of all, the Syria is the Syrian conflict is going international. We had a we had a, a former American ambassador, Lebanese ambassador, uh, killed. I think you know very within the last uh, week um, by a bomb in in Lebanon. There, that, that's kind of getting out of control. I mean, the hopeful sign, and of course, Israel Palestine remains unresolved. And John Kerry is a fool to think he's going to change that. Um, the uh, but but you do have this larger Sunni Shia thing starting to emerge, right? This larger Sunni Shia tension and and tearing apart various societies, uh, showing the signs of that. Lebanon, Iraq, not just Syria. Um, the the Iran thing is hopeful, but there you have what I would call extremists in both the U.S. and Iran trying to derail the deal. You, you're probably skeptical of, uh, uh, about the value of the deal to begin with. But I think uh, if we played our cards right, uh, we could actually, that could be a great thing, bringing Iran back into the community of nations, uh, which I think in the long run could be a product of this deal. So that's good. But again, that there are people so determined to derail that in both the U.S. and Iran that I'm not. I, I don't have any doubt in myself that Iran will have nuclear weapons in 10 years. Hmm. De deal or no deal. And and I, look, I think the Middle East is is less of a concern to me for one big reason. We're not we're not there in a big way. We're well, not you know we are probably, there. Well, not 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 the way we used to be in Iraq. That's for sure. We're we're tuning out of Afghanistan. But we we're there just in the very sense that we're in Asia, which is that we have com commitments to Israel and Saudi Arabia, just as we have commitments to Japan and South Korea. I, I don't think that our commitment to Saudi Arabia is me too meaningful. Well, okay, Israel. Israel is meaningful, and I think the Israelis can defend themselves. I don't. I, I think that look, the Sunni-Shia war can go on all around the Middle East, and yeah. except for the occasional fog of poison gas or something, yeah. uh, I don't think the Israelis have much well, to lose from that. I, I would say. I think they're better I, off. I, I do think, think the Israelis can, can fight each other, but the Israelis are better off. I do think Israel can can withstand a whole lot and spends uh, more time concerned about its survival than is really in order, but. Um, the uh, on Iran, I, I think if there is a deal at the end of this six months, I don't think they'll have nuclear weapons in 10 years. On the other hand, if you think they will, which is not impossible, and yet you're not concerned, I take it one thing you're saying is that nuclear weapons in the hands of Iran needn't be destabilizing. There, I agree. It would well, not I, I, be I, a game I would change. put it another way. It's probably is, it is destabilizing. It's just inevitable. It's not well, that hard but to if make it's a way. If it's destabilizing, you should be more concerned than you sound. I don't I'm, think I'm, it fundamentally I'm, I'm, is. I'm, I'm concerned about things that will get the United States into into World War III. Those I'm concerned about. Well, well, okay? well I'm so not you don't concerned think... about the U.S. intervening in South Sudan because I don't think that'll lead to anything. Okay, but in other words, you don't think, as Bibi Netanyahu claims, that if Iran had nuclear weapons, they would use them on Israel. No, no. Well, we agree. Right. And um, I, however, however, on this on the, on the abundance of caution principle, I do think that both the U.S. and Israel, and for that matter, South Korea and Japan, and you know whoever else, need to make a major investment in missile defense. Uh, because even though I don't think it'll happen, I would I can't rule out the possibility. What I can rule out is the idea that there's anything that the U.S. or Israel can do to stop Iran from ultimately getting a nuclear weapon. Uh, oh, I think if if we didn't face um, the the domestic uh, constraints, as they say, when they're referring to APAC and allied groups, um, on on our policymaking, I think we would get the deal done with Iran uh, in six months, and I don't think they'd wind up with a nuclear weapon. But, I, don't, I don't think they'd keep it. Oh, I think they would. The, uh, the deal that they envision and that their president, their president envisions and we envision involves just totally unprecedented monitoring. It's not like it would be easy. Them they're, they're a smart and clever people, and just because they sign some deal with some dope like John Kerry doesn't mean they're going to keep it. Okay, we'll see. I mean, I, mean, I don't think I don't think you know. Look again, what, we, what Bob, what you and I share is a common kind of realist worldview, and as I mentioned with China, the the one smart sort of economic strategic thing that Chairman Mao did was built was get an A bomb. China has been attack proof hmm. since 1964. Okay, I well, mean, countries that have A bombs go. Are, are attack proof. Yeah. The Iranians know that, well, and, I, I, and, and they're not going to they're not going to get de derailed because the stupid P five tells them not to do it. Well, no, but uh, well, 
No, but 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 I agree with what you're saying that I, what you're implying, which is that if Iran does go for a nuclear weapon, it will be partly out of a belief that that is what it takes to remain secure. And that is a perception that could be altered by our behavior toward Iran. They really believe that America w would like to invade them. And that's part yeah, this, of the motivation I, for ability. If, if they look at the Iranians, if America suddenly, you know, goes peacenik and the, the Iranians still have to deal with the Arabs and the Saudis and the Pakistanis. And every, I mean, it's just look, it's just so obvious to a country. This is the ticket. That takes you into a, just like Pakistan. Yeah. Why are we still giving a billion or so years to Pakistan? It's for one reason. It gets you a kind of respect to have yeah, a nuclear weapon. There's no doubt about it. So the Pakistanis don't do what they probably are going to wind up doing, which is sell an a bomb to your choice, Iran or Saudi Arabia or Kuwait or, or whoever, uh, just because that's kind of just what it's. It, it, there's no in the history of the universe. There's no weapon that somebody invented that didn't get used, and and, and, and once one country gets it, the other countries want it. Okay. So that is a so your view of the Middle East is tragic but not apocalyptic. Your view right, of China right. is apocalyptic. Tra tra tragic, and, but actually, in a way, from an American point of view, and even for, and also from an Israeli point of view, it is not it is not that, it's not that bad when your enemies are fighting each other. No, it's not. I, I think Israel's threats arise from another front, which is which is not not solving the Palestinian problem. But I think you disagree. But I think you you think that can go on forever without. I do. I, 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 I do think. I, I think the Palestinian problem is being solved uh, in, in an unsatisfactory way uh, right before our eyes. In, in what sense? Just planning on not planning on giving an inch. Yeah, well, that's not a solution, though. I mean, the, the, the grievances will remain. Uh, grievances will remain, but that's all right. They just that's it's. I, I think eventually, any Palestinian who feels sufficiently aggrieved will will go. Will leave. Well, uh, that may be uh, a hope in some quarters in in Israel that you'll have a kind of a slow motion. Ethnic right. cleansing. I mean, there there are Israeli politicians who talk that way, but um, I, th I think, I think, I think it's going to take a long have, time. They have uh, the best handle on the situation. But but meanwhile, Israel's starting to face you know facing a little ramping up of the international pressure on this front. They had the recent academic you know pseudo boycott by the, the American Studies Association or whatever. I mean, in other words, it's not a boycott with teeth, but. Uh, but it, it, that kind of thing scares them. It gets their attention, and, and you could well, have it, more it, of that. It seem, I don't think it really does scare them. I think it annoys them. It, it, it's, it's irksome, that's for yeah. sure. But look, you, I, if you give me a choice, the boycott by the American Studies Association and throw in another five or ten you know, liberal arts uh, academic groups, including in, the, in the, the European Union, or three or four more iterations of Moore's Law, I'll take the latter, and so would the Israelis. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, I don't think that's going to do it. I think their their fear, their genuine fear is that it grows into something like South Africa faced. It gets beyond the token. Yeah. And, and that's why they want to head it off now. That's why you get the fierce resistance to this kind of thing. And that's why I think, I think that's why the, 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 the problem that South Africa had was that it was, you know, what, 75% black and Israel doesn't have that problem. No, but it seems reluctant to give the vote. It's got enough Palestinians in the West Bank that it doesn't want to see them voting, uh, much less uh, in Gaza. Um, so, uh, Enough levity, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> what, how do you feel about the legalization of marijuana? It's going to happen January 1st in Colorado, I think. Yeah, Are you planning I, a little vacation there for uh, a little no, Boulder, a little hiking in Boulder, perhaps? Um, I'm not... I'm not a pot. I'm, I'm sort of. I'm not against legalization, but I'm not a pot smoker, and so I'm sort of don't really have a dog in that fight. I, I suspect that it will not work out as well for the legalization side as they hope in terms of, the, I think there will be problems. You will see a lot of minors puffing away. Um, you will discover that smoking marijuana causes lung cancer just as smoking tobacco causes lung cancer. Um, but, you know, sometimes you just have to work your way through a problem. So you're not, so you, okay. So we have zero real concern about that. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, I'm not for pot, smoking pot, but I'm also not for throwing people, throwing people in jail for doing it. What about cocaine? I don't know. I mean, I, I guess I'm probably. What, what do you think? <laughs> hey, I ask the questions, buddy. You sit there and squirm uncomfortably. That's the division of labor here. Okay. I thought we made that clear. But cocaine's a tough one. I actually think I am. Uh, I, I would not rush to legalize cocaine. I think it's in a different category from there. I, I, first of all, I think marijuana, I think all drugs are addictive, basically, in some meaningful sense, in the sense of 
uh, being habit forming in a way that can be hard for some people to break. Marijuana for certain kinds of people, it does turn them into slackers and sap their ambition. And uh, as a parent, I was relieved to see my kids get through their teens without that happening. I was, it had been, you know, a concern, not, not because of the way they behave, but just since they were very young, I thought, well, I, well, I hope they don't like, you know, start smoking dope every day in high school. Uh, Cause I think that can put you on in a certain path. That said, I agree with you. You can't be throwing people in jail for this. Uh, cocaine, you know, it's funny in principle, the same, it feels crazy to throw people in jail for whatever they do to their own lives, you know, but it's also true that cocaine is a more insidious drug. Um, and, uh, so I don't know. I, 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 it's your turn. What do you think? The one, the one thing I'll say in the long run, you know, I think uh, piety eats hedonism. And, and I, again, I, since, I, since I put my credentials down as somebody who worries about America being defeated in a war, I mean, really defeated, as in abandoning your cities because they're in flames. Uh, and meanwhile, the other guy's tanks are going through your, your capital. Uh, it would be bad strategy, bad national destiny for America to have a country full of potheads when the, when the guy comes to so your concern, just to fully flesh out the apocalyptic vision, is the Chinese tanks show up at the steps of the White House and everyone in D.C. is like stoned and watching the Three Stooges on reruns on TV. And eating brownies. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, no, I mean, okay. Let me be clear. I don't – it's not so much like – I, I, it's not, I don't really blame the Chinese for having the exact same ambitions that we do. OK, I, I, I think that's perfectly understandable. It, it's it's the waning and waxing of empires. And when and and, and a hundred things could go wrong with China, just like a things could go wrong with America. I just I, I, and I think the modern warfare will consist of cyber hacking and blinding satellites and, you know, a, a few cruise missiles here and there. Um, and when, when I read, for example, on ZDNet three years ago that the Chinese have, quote, pervasive access to 80 percent of the communications equipment in the world. 80% in the world, I, I think the, the next war could be kind of pathetically push button where you sort of we suddenly wake up one day and realize that we can't turn on our, our internet. Um, and at that point, a, a modern country can't fight and a modern economy can't function. I, I don't think it, I don't think you need, you need to invade. I, I do think, however, and again, the back to this, this ship collision or near collision in, in, in the Pacific a few weeks ago, that plus what's going on with North Korea and the St. Kakwa reminds us that even in this cyber virtual digital age, the imperatives of what great powers do, which is to say they fight over principles and territories and air defense zones and so on, that never changes. That's a, that's a again, we, we can, be, if we were smart, we'd be saying, look, it's great that we have all this digital Google you know, that stuff. Now, now let's make sure that it's weaponizable uh, so that if we needed it in a, in a confrontation, not because I, because we enjoy fighting. I'm look, I'm, I'm basically a dove as I think you are, Bob. Uh, I, I'm just simply a, a heavily armed dove because it, because you can't be a dove in a world where other people are interested in military solutions. You can be, I just think you think you'll be a dead dove. You'll be, you'll be a dead dove. Yeah. And so the pot smoking thing, again, I can't, as you, just as with you, I agree. The cocaine is a is a different a different category. I can't be against it. I just think we're we're going to ultimately need a plan of suasion, not criminality, but uh, criminalization. But suasion that says, look, you really owe it to yourself and your family and your country uh, to keep your marbles together, not just become a, a pot. Because we both have seen it, just being living in being products of the baby boomer products of the 50s. I do know a lot of kids I went to high school with who really never recovered from being potheads. Yeah. And they're now fixing bicycles in their, in their middle age. Which is, you know, their worst lives. But I agree that it can alter your path in life fundamentally. And it's a it could be a pretty seductive drug. Otherwise, I mean, I, I, I at the same time, I'm not saying on balance it does more damage than alcohol. I suspect it does worse. It certainly gets fewer people killed on the highways, but um, and fewer and fewer spouses beaten. Um, right, but so, so, right, all those all those things again. Yeah, yeah, that's that's back to suasion. You, it, look, we put a lot of effort in this country. You know, pro, prohibition is kind of laughable. However, fights fights against drunk driving and fights for temperance and fights for self discipline and fights for you know uh, coffee as opposed to 
alcohol. I mean, those, those are all worth doing, and it, it's, it's a lot more work if you have to spend your time going sort of person to person, saying, "Look, you know, all things in moderation." Um, I, I think that's. I think. I think. Mer- Washington State and Colorado, those are the two places I think that have legalized pot just as by referendum, are both going to sort of realize five years from now that this problem they have is a lot more complicated than they realize well, when they Well, for one thing, they're going to become, uh, because the other states haven't legalized it, they're going to become a slacker magnet, man. I mean, they really are. And then they're going to, and that's going to be a backlash, believe me. But people um, end, end up on unemployment and disability because they just they can just sit, 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 yeah. live, live, in a, live in a blanket on the sidewalk across the street from the dispensary. Right now, now, the good news, the redeeming thing here, Jim, as I'm sure you'll agree and celebrate, is that if, you know, in Colorado, Washington, you develop uh, a marijuana problem, you need to go to rehab. I think maybe that's covered in Obamacare, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> and, and surely, if that's true, you will celebrate that with me. <laughs> No, I mean, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm not a fan of Obamacare. I mean, I, I think the law has been implemented un- unbelievably badly. I think it'll be the gift that keeps, that keeps on giving to Republicans through the 14 and 16 elections, at least. Um, however, just uh, I, we still face the problem. <clears throat> no matter, even if you know Ted Cruz is elected president in 16, which I doubt will happen, um, and you, you you repeal it, you still have the reality that. Since 1986, uh, people have been guaranteed a primitive form of health insurance through the Emergency Treatment and Labor Act, signed by President Reagan, that I've never heard any Republican say that he or she wants to repeal. What, what does that act say, actually? I wasn't aware it's, of that as an act, per se. It says you can go to the emergency room and get treatment. That's a, a, that's a federal, federal law? A, federally, a hospital with federal funding, which almost all of them have. Huh. Um, and, <clears throat> and in addition, not only is there a federal law that says so, but it's the practical reality is that if, if you show up with a gunshot wound or a, or a cocaine seizure uh, in any hospital, the Hippocratic Oath will kick in and more than likely they will treat you. I mean, they, they, this doesn't happen all the time. There certainly are cases where they push on a, a bus and, or, and take you to say, hey, go to County General, not, not here. Mm-hmm. And there are plenty of hospitals that have shut down their emergency rooms, because, especially in Texas, where they can't deal with the uh, illegal population and the, the, the swell of people coming from Mexico. Um, you, so you mod- can evade that law by just shutting down your emergency room? Yeah, yeah. That's kind of a loophole. Uh, it is, but it's kind of a negative loophole for the rest of us, right? Uh, what do you mean? Well, I mean, if, if we can't, if you and I being taxpaying yuppie citizens. Right. We would like an emergency room. We would like the emergency room. Right. 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 And and so um, there is, even if you go through the conservative literature on alternatives to Obamacare, you wind up, well, we'll have high risk pools. I mean, high risk pools, Medicaid. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I don't think that repealing Obamacare, which, look, you can go through the 3,000 pages, that's really stupid, that's really stupid, that's really stupid, that's really stupid, and any Republican should, and any Democrat should say, well, we should get rid of that. However, the the basic point of a, of a mandate, I'm, I'm sort of mystified as to why a mandate to buy health insurance is a bad idea. We have a mandate to pay for people's health. Why should, and they get, as I just mentioned with MTLA, we pay for people to have, to get covered. Mm-hmm. Uh, in effect, so why shouldn't we make them pay? Uh, uh, again, I don't think <clears throat> I think the amounts of money are pretty small. I mean, it's and, uh, bordering on symbolic in many cases. But uh, anything that emerges post Obamacare will, I think, end up looking suspiciously like either Obamacare itself or Medicaid. Well, do you think Obamacare is not going to survive the website fiasco? It'll survive it. I, I think it will. I, th- I think. Look, the Democrats have dug it, are, are, are going to dig in. I mean, they may they may well lose the Senate in 2014 over Obamacare and the backlash against it, they may well lose the White House. Um, but there's a, there was a piece in the, in the I, I forgot, I forgot, in the New York Times the other day, it quoted a bunch of Republicans, including you know Senator Johnson of, of Wisconsin, uh, saying, look, you know, the exchanges are kind of a good idea. We got to keep those. Um, I think, look, the, the Republicans have the luxury now of just sort of flamethrowing Obamacare. And mm-hmm. it's, it's been run horribly. And it's a permanent... Uh, 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 dare I say, black spot on, on the president's record, and it just proves he's not a he's not a good president, not a competent executive, and the whole. But I think the the left is saying, "Well, see, we told you we want, we want a single pair all along, and this is a sort of growing pain on our way to UK UK and NHS, which is what they've always wanted." Mm-hmm. Um, and um, I think the Republicans. Have, 
it behooves them strongly to dream of something to do other than simply say, yes, we agree with you that we'll have to replace Obamacare and then we'll have a showdown election in 16 or 20 where the battle is single payer versus uh, whatever else. It's a combination of Republican alternative plus status quo. Isn't there the short term problem for Obamacare that if, whether because of the website fiasco or for some other reason, but probably partly because of that, there are not enough of these younger, healthier people buying into the system, then the premiums for the rest of the people will be uh, disturbingly high. Because after all, most of them aren't used to paying premiums that reflect uh, a prohibition on excluding people for pre-existing conditions, which can be an expensive premium if you don't have all these uh, younger people buying into the system. So isn't there, I mean, do you see that as one of the dangers that you think will make it ultimately a a possibly damaging issue for Democrats? I, I, I mean, I, I do. I, I absolutely do. But I, on the other hand, I'm not exactly sure what the alternative is. I mean, it's 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 whether or not young people have insurance policy. It's just paper, okay? In other words, if, if somebody is old and sick and they're, they're going to get covered, it's going to be it's going to be charity, it's going to be Medicaid, it's going to be bankruptcy. It's going to the money's going to come. The, the hospital just eat it. The money's going to come from somewhere. You don't. You, it's, it, we sort of live in an illusion that well. The only way to make the pool viable is to get you know, people who don't need health insurance to get into the pool. That, that's one way. Another way is just simply to pay for it. We already are paying for it, is kind of my point. Yeah. And so I, I just sort of think it was kind of trickery. And, it, and, and, and the trick was really on Obama and the Democrats for saying, ah, yes, we need to put put in this profoundly unpopular idea of a mandate on Starbucks workers uh, to make the sort of fake accounting of the whole system match so that we can get it through the Senate and the House in 2009 and 2010, as opposed to simply saying, look, this is what it, this is what health care costs for America. And we think everybody deserves this level of coverage and we're going to pay for it one way or another, and which is what's going to happen. It's just, it's just it's sort of silly to have created this sort of incompetent, inept, idiocracy police state to make sure that somebody making 10000 a year puts in 200 a year for insurance. It's, it's sort of, it was sort of a, a, a Mickey Mouse, Rube Goldberg thing that frankly deserved to fail. Even as the basic commitment that we have to keep people from not only bleeding to death on the street after they have to have an, an accident, but also the public interest we share of not having people coughing on us uh, with tuberculosis uh, or, you know, what, whatever other kind of, you know, uh, 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 just reading somewhere about swine flu. Meningitis I mean, where I live, buddy. Meningitis, yeah, swine flu. I mean, so five people died in California from swine flu. I mean, there's a, there's a, the, the, a dense population, a densely packed population of which most of America is, uh, has extreme public incentive to prevent people from walking around with contagions. Um, okay, so I guess when the Heritage Foundation thought up this plan, it was actually a long-term and clever scheme to plant it in the brains of liberals <laughs> where it would blow up. Uh, it does seem to work that way, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, could well. Now, here's a, here, I have a what would Jesus do question for you that's related to Obamacare, Jim. Now, I'm serious. Last okay. time I checked with you, you were, you were taking... Uh, the, the, the words of Jesus seriously, the um, what would Jesus do if he were a Republican governor and the federal government said to him, as Obamacare says to them, look, we would like to expand the coverage for these people who are very, very close to the poverty line, but don't right now have access to Medicaid to, to basically free health care. There's not a huge, you know, we, we're not going to expand it hugely, but there's some of these people we can help in your state. We will pay for almost all of it, right? It's like 90% or something. You guys you guys have to chip in almost a token amount to do a, quite a bit of good for these people who are who are very close to the poverty line. Uh, if Jesus were a Republican governor in one of these states, what would he say? He'd say expand Medicaid, I think. Yeah. I, okay. I, 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 I was going to say, I shouldn't, just for the record here. <laughs> just, this, <laughs> no, no, we're going to end the taping right, there. Right. You said, just said that most Republican governors are not good Christians. The show is over. We're ending the taping. You're not allowed to elaborate. Sorry, Jim. See you next year. <laughs> I, I look. I, I support Governor Kasich and Governor Brewer and me too. I, I, I lost they track. did the right thing. I, I think they did the right thing. 
Um, I, I should be more careful in saying, I'm not sure who knows what Jesus is doing, but I suspect I mean, Jesus always sort of struck me as kind of a social Democrat um, in his economics anyway. And so as, as along with the Pope. Uh, uh, and so I, I would say to Republicans, I say to America, I say to even you, Bob, look, the, the real breakout of health care is not going to be some rejiggering of finance. It's going to be a, a, a transformation of the science. OK, uh, who, if, if we all wind up with Alzheimer's and it's a 200 billion plus billion dollar hit on the economy now headed towards a trillion dollars a year by mid-century, it doesn't really matter very much whether it's Obamacare or, or Paul Ryan care or Bob Wright care as a financing scheme to deal with all these people, including or you know potentially you and me, uh, sitting in a drooling in, in some dementia ward somewhere. It, it's it's this, and the same is true with diabetes and cancer and all sorts of things. The 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 the, the missing element in our politics when it comes to healthcare are the words research, medicine, and cures. No, no nobody talks like it. it I, I actually interesting enough, I saw Richard Posner. You know the the uh, judge, the judge in the seventh Cir- the seventh circuit, seventh court of appeals in Chicago, who's a you know very well known guy, prominent conservative, appointed by President Reagan, saying, look, if we don't tackle some of these issues, and he mentioned Alzheimer's as a, a scientific problem, it, it's going to cr- it's going to crush us financially. I think you had a good point. It was in this blog a couple of days ago. Uh, I think it was exactly right. Um, that to me. You know, I'm with Peter Drucker. Don't solve problems, pursue opportunities. The healthcare, as long as healthcare is unbelievably complicated to consume, and 90% of it is paid for by third parties, which is the the, to- the total for the U.S., then ain't, ain't, ain't you show me a system nobody can understand, and somebody else is paying for it, and I guarantee, no matter who runs it, it's going to be complicated and a mess, and nobody's going to like it. Okay, and I, I by the same token, I don't think that you're going to achieve a massive reduction of that 90% figure to even 85% anytime soon. It's just too hard. By contrast, fixing things, solving problems, applying Moore's law to medicine, um, it, it, hard as that is, is easy compared to changing human, human behavior. Okay. Even if I accept all that, I would still like to briefly revisit this Republican governor point because I've got to say, I do think of all the politically motivated acts we see all the time, this really is one of the most reprehensible, I've got to say, in my view. These Republican governors who are choosing not to cover these essentially poor people when it would cost their state almost nothing, and they're doing it to make a political point. And uh, it's just just a a, a more vivid example than usual, I think, of what uh, what is the word scum? I guess so many politicians. Well, I, I, I think, look, I think Medicaid is so rife with fraud that I think you can make a... a yeah, but that's a, not their actual concern. I, I understand. I think it, it would be more useful to say, look, we agree in the goal. Yeah. Everybody gets covered. Now, let's go after the the ophthalmologists in South Florida and so on. I mean, and these these Medicaid mills, there's stories all the time about, you know, people getting prescribed, you know, 200 pairs of eyeglasses and having spinal surgery, you know, over and over again. Um, but that that is a long term challenging fight uh, that I suspect would if the if the ultimate accounting were done I suspect I, I think it'd be easy to find that a third of Medicaid was total waste and fraud. Oh, I'd be surprised if it's that high. But anyway, I, I've I've done my little sermon. What else is there? Uh, what else is there to talk about? There is the there is the uh, the partisan rancor, the lack of civility, and the general coming apart of America at the seams thing. Are you concerned about that? Oh. Sure, but I but I think it's a function of the incompetence of the elites. I, I blame the elites. Okay, like elaborate on that. Elaborate on that. I share with the average American a deep distrust of the competence of the people who gave us the Iraq War and the global warming crusade and uh, Obamacare. Um, you know, I, I the elites have to prove that they're worthy of our trust, and they're not proving that. You mean the elites, like in Congress, or you mean elites more broadly? Yeah, the opinion, the opinion forming elites, some some combination of the Congress plus the big media plus the foundations. Um, I, I think they're done the, the country a deep disservice, uh, uh, yeah. and and I don't think I don't think they're. I, I I can't imagine putting my faith in them. And now that doesn't mean that. I mean, by the way, I, I think. 
my answer is we should have a better elite. My answer is we should have smart elites, not stupid elites, uh, who, who focus on problems that we actually face um, and solve them. And I, and I think I, that, I see a remarkable absence of that. And so in, in the meantime, I don't blame people for being angry. Now, are you and I elites? And if so, are we good elites or bad elites? Well, I think, I think the question is, do you, do you have a, a, a model in your head that would work to make the country better? I do. Okay. I, so do I, I think I, yeah, you know, if I, everyone agreed with me, I, I think actually, you know, look, Bob, you and look, you and I have agreed on probably more things than we disagreed on over the years. Uh, uh, let's let's take away the things that, I, you know, uh, again, I think the last 12 years in the Middle East has been a mistake. I think the the effort to squelch the economy by stopping CO2 without thinking through alternative energy. And I don't mean solar. I mean, nuclear or a adequate, satisfactory carbon sequestration plan. Um, I think that's ludicrous in its inapplicability to the problems we face in the 21st century. If plants have been turning CO2 into a solid for billions of years, then why can't we figure out how to do it? And, I, and those are the kind of, instead, we're having this sort of lame argument about cutting CO2 when the Chinese are cranking out more CO2 than we ever will, um, and the Russians and everybody else. And we're sitting here strangling our own industries. Uh, you know, I mean, I, there's, I was reading this book. Are recently. we really, though? I mean, basically, we, uh, how stringent are the actual domestic regulations on CO2? Put it this way, the, 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 the regulations are getting a lot more stringent. They, wiped, they basically wiped out coal, which they're happy to say they've, they've done. They're delighted. They're, they're proud of themselves for that. Uh, uh, um, I mean, the, I was reading, I'm influenced by a book by... Uh, uh, by Paisano and she, they're professors at the Harvard Business School, and the, and the book is something like producing producing prosperity. That's it. Harvard Business School, 2012, and it is unbelievably scary to read through how much industrial prowess this country, America, has lost in the, relative to the world in the last 10 or 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. And it's a com as they say, it's a combination of short term accounting by corporations, trade policies, and uh, I, I have to believe that uh, if, we, if we're trying to compete with low wage labor, then it, it certainly behooves us to make, for example, electricity free. I, mean, I don't mean low cost, I mean free. And if you have, a, if, if, there's no reason why, you know, the original idea of nuclear power, which is so cheap you could, didn't have to meter it, that to me, that to me still strikes me as a good idea um, in terms of encouraging people to make things that it, here in America, not only for our prosperity, but also for our national defense. Okay. Uh, what was I going to say about this whole uh, energy issue? I mean, I believe I agree that, n that nuclear uh, deserves a second look. Um, I, I, I'm I'm just not actually aware that that, uh, and I haven't looked into it that much. That our regulations are so stifling or costing us all that much money, um, energy wise. Uh, well, but, we're, not, we're not using our resources. Yeah, I mean, but it seems to, me, to some extent what you're saying here and in the realm of healthcare is why haven't we invented more? You know, why why haven't we come up with the miracle solutions? And like, I don't know, we've had the free enterprise system working on it. I thought you were a champion of that, but, but I am champion of the free enterprise system. But I'm also a, a, a realist in knowing that the great inventions tend to come from nonprofits. Uh, or, or semi or monopolistic profits, Bell Labs, uh, uh, research institutions. They, they they come from a national policy that says we need more of this. Okay, the, Al Alfred North Whitehead, the famous British mathematician and philosopher, said the greatest invention of the 19th century is the idea of the invention. Okay, as in if you put people in a room and say, look, we need a chemical industry, <clears throat> we need we need a new weapon, we need a new cure for this, we need a cure, we need a new solution for that. You you get it. I, I don't think for a second that Barack Obama has sat with his advisors and said, hey, we need some new breakthrough thing on this or this or this or this. I also don't pick the thing on Boehner's done either. <laughs> so, but, but, but huge, yeah. Lots of resources have gone into a cure for cancer and it hasn't happened. I mean, there's been yeah. some improvement in care. but death, death, death rate for cancer has fallen by 60% in the last 40 years since, since Nixon's war on cancer. Now, that may, not, that may not satisfy you, but it makes it makes a big difference. A lot. Look, the number of people who died of prostate cancer has fallen by like 80%. Well, there's also a big over-treatment issue there, but... but well, okay, what, which which do you worry well, more? Well, I mean, I mean, a damaging over-treatment issue. About being over treated for prostate cancer or dying of prostate cancer? Well, you, uh, well, it depends on how many people you've got winding up sterile or impotent or whatever you wind up. Uh, I, would, I, I wouldn't make... The trade-off isn't, uh, you know, I, I, I wouldn't infinitely trade off, uh, you know, deaths for, for sterility and impotence.
Um, well, if, you're, if you're 70 years old, it might not be the end of the world to be <laughs> sterile and impotent. Speak for yourself, buddy. My aspirations, <laughs> I'm already thinking about, I've already got my whole life planned out for the next 20, 30 years. And believe you me, I'm going to be having some fun. I mean, look, I, I, obviously we want maximum success and minimum failure. Okay, the, 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 the death rate from heart disease has fallen by three fourths since the fifties. Okay, we, we've 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 been extremely triumphant in some areas. We just, we've been lacking for any kind of national vision. This is again back to the elites of there is a technological solution to these medical problems that does not involve celebrating socialism or celebrating a quote good death unquote or natural this and homeopathic that and so on it's, it's just it's just again it's why the elites aren't really worthy of our no i agree i'm pretty disappointed in the elites i mean in the realm of foreign policy in particular i mean i i i thought the way america was thought to work 30 40 years ago was that like you know the, these guys from wall street were like orchestrating our foreign policy that would be okay with me because i think you know <laughs> I, I i that would be an improvement right because i i think pure capitalists want a stable environment for capitalism to work in right they don't want to be <laughs> Unless well, they happen to be in the arms industry, they don't really want to be invading a lot of countries. Uh, I, I worry a little bit when you say the, the lawyer, there were more lawyers from New York. I don't York. want them in charge of economic I, policy. I want to emphasize that. Just foreign policy. <laughs> yeah, but economic policy that just celebrates financialism and, and, and stock market bubbles is not an economic it's not an economic strategy, okay? No, but I mean no no, I'm not talking about economics. I'm saying they would be anti war. In theory, in theory, Wall Street should be anti war. I just lament the the uh, the days when uh, American elites were thought at least to value uh, world stability. The, the elites governing foreign policy were thought to value world stability, which means valuing peace. Uh, uh, I, I would say I would say it it, it 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 emphasizes peace through strength. I mean, again, peace peace as a policy is not very good. Uh, peace through strength as a policy is good. I mean, and 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 and, and strategy. I mean, look, the elites that that we retrospectively have come to admire the people who led us through the cold war to success uh, um we're we're, we're tough minded they made mistakes which, which i would count vietnam as one i think you probably would too yep. but they had successes like the strategic defense initiative which was a huge I success count that as a huge success pardon what did we get out of that the victory in the cold war oh give me a break you know what gave us victory in the Cold War? The fact that communism doesn't work as an economic system. No, I think it, it was it was. The, the, I I I was told this by by the former Russian ambassador to the United States, a guy named Luke L U K H I N, who, who said to a group at the Carnegie Endowment twenty years ago, said that this this was he said when the when when Reagan announced SEI in eighty three, then Soviet leader Andropov said, well, gee whiz, we got to study this. So they created two studies, one from the Soviet military and one from the Soviet Academy of Sciences. They came back two years later. And, and, and Andrew Bob had died. Just got Chernenko had died too. And then now it's Gorbachev. And they said, listen, we don't know if the Americans can do this. This is a report now. This is Lucan talking. And it was, I gave it to Paul Chico in the Wall Street Journal at the time. Um, but we know we can't. So well, why we couldn't can't. they? Because communism didn't work as an economic so, system. And, it, and if SDI hadn't focused them on that fact, other things were focusing them on the Gorbachev fact. Gorbachev said, you're right, we, we, got, we need to reshape our system so that we can compete with this. And remember, Gorbachev's first idea as leader in Russia in Soviet Union in 85 was not Glasnost and Paris Reagan. It was something called Uskarini, which meant acceleration. Just work harder. It was stakhanovism. And that didn't work. And then, and so then they stumbled their way through Glasnost and Paris Reich, uh, and, uh, and in doing so, they pulled apart their own system. But a, as Lukin said, this is a quote, it's in the journal, I think it was probably 1991, now that I think about it, said the, the Reagan's SDI, quote, accelerated the, the fall of the Soviet Union by five to ten years, unquote. That seems to me like high, but, the, but, but my main point is that, uh, uh, high at best, but my main point is that the, the, the outcome of the Cold War was inevitable as long as we didn't blow up the world in the meanwhile. Their system was failing. They had a billion incentives to finally reform it and try to move it to in a more market-oriented way. What exactly got their attention? Uh, I, I don't know. So, but, so you're, not, you're not understanding somebody's first-person testimony? No, it may, have, it may have played a role. I'm just saying it was inevitable. What he was saying, What he was saying is what I said. They had an economic system that couldn't yeah. couldn't do anything. It couldn't produce elaborate technological things, but it also couldn't give the uh, create a middle class. It was just it was just I was there while it was still the Soviet Union. It was a joke. The department stores. You go to the consumer electronics section. This is like in 1990, 91, and where we would have like TVs. You would look, 
and they would have like vacuum tubes to take home and fix your TV that doesn't work. You would buy the vacuum. You would go to where we would buy washing machines. They literally, this is the finest department store in Leningrad or St. Petersburg, or whatever it was called at the time. They would have washboards, washboards. Yeah, Bob, they, nations don't necessarily fall because their consumers are unhappy. Well, okay, but whatever. They couldn't keep subsidizing all their client states. It, it, they just it couldn't was, keep it, was, it together. It was, it was armaments, everything. They couldn't it, it, do anything. It, 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 look, look, I mean, we, we, we might, uh, might even agree to disagree on this point. But in any case, the elite that came up with SDI, is, which, which I believe that even you have to passively concede, is, push the Soviet Union further towards collapse, will also come in handy if we if the North Koreans fire a missile at us or the Chinese or the Iranians or the whoever's and it's the kind of thing that a good elite would be working on and a bad elite would say oh no no that'll have to come second to uh, um you know some whatever stupid thing they're working on now no i disagree both because these systems in real life never wind up working the first time you can test them all you want but in the environment they're actually operating in it's not going to stop a nuclear attack, if there is one, A, and B, it just puts you in the wrong frame of mind. The right frame of mind to be in is we have to prevent. We have to we, we have to create a situation where they're not going to launch. So, how, so how, how, how would you apply this Bob Wright logic to North Korea? Well, North Korea is just a question of waiting until it collapses and talking okay. to China about it. So, 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 so they, the beginning of a solution, they're, North they're Korea, rockets, is they're building nuclear weapons and rockets and you want to just want to you just want to wait. Well, I think we should be talking to China more about it. it, it it's another incentive to work things out with China. But what, if what, Chinese, what, if, what if the Chinese are interested? But, but look, what, North Korea is not going to launch a nuclear missile at the United States. It, it, if, if a nuclear bomb winds up, a, if a North Korean nuclear bomb winds up going off in America, it'll be because they sold it to a terrorist who who who, who snuck it in. So, and so the, fact, the fact that they're building A-bombs and rockets shouldn't is, is, is not relevant. I'm just saying country. that it's not going to hit us for, on a missile. It's, well, it's, it's, it, it's, if it does blow up in America, it will not have come into America on a missile. What if it is Japan? North Korea is not going to attack. How do, how do you know? How do you, how do you know? Why are they, why are they do they Look, again, Bob, when things get built, they get used. No, actually, them, actually, them, actually them. Jeb, we've built a jillion nuclear weapons. And since the first two, we've never used them. The Soviet Union have never used any of theirs. The Chinese have never used any of theirs. And nobody they built all the time without getting used. Nobody thinks that's the final status of nuclear weapons. Well, uh, gonna, life is long. The world, the world is long. Right, but we have made some progress in the realm of nuclear nonproliferation, and as you know, global governance is a hobby horse of mine, and that could be a whole other discussion. But, um, but glo global governance is fine for Kazakhstan. The Chinese are interested. Actually, I don't know that that's uh, necessarily true. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not interested in sharing. Have the they been? Government. Have they been super irresponsible in the UN Security Council? No, I, I, Bob, it's just, it's just they're just a different country. They have different interests. Okay, I, I'm not interested in being part of. I don't want. I wouldn't want them governing us, and I wouldn't want uh, just like they wouldn't want us governing them. They want it into the it, World it, Trade it, Organization. You know, and India and all the rest of these. What, they want it into the World Trade Organization. That's not global governance. Sorry, the, Isn't the, World, Trade the, Trade the, way config, the we, World Trade Organization is the way it's configured is helping them. It's free trade plus their currency devaluation. They're winning big in the current game. If, if, the, if the World Trade Organization cut against them, actually, they would change their mind. Actually, the World Trade Organization allows everyone, including us, a way to kind of sublimate political pressure for tariffs and things by saying, wait, let's send this to the dispute mechanism of the WTO. Right. And I would say we all benefit from that. So smart countries, of which we're not one, simply say, okay, fine, the WTO mandates this dope tariff thing, that's fine. So we'll think of non-tariff ways, non ways to do it. They would be and playing the, the same WTO, currency game with or, with or without, it. Jim, with or without the WTO, their currency policy would be essentially the same. Well, but I'm saying the, then the WTO is worthless at a stated objective. No, it's not worthless. It defuses trade tensions so they don't turn into conflicts. It's it's, it's not producing trade tensions when the Chinese are flooding our market and deindustrializing this country. It's, it's weakening this country. 50,000 50, factories have closed in America in the last 20 years. They're flooding the market with cheap labor. Well, okay, but it, it, that's the way everybody floods markets. Well, yeah, right. right. It, it's it's not in our national interest not to have an autonomous industrial commons that can produce not only wealth but also. I mean, this is this is so 
much the history of this world of, to say, countries that, that had a conscious industrial policy, whether it was the United States or Germany in the 19th century or China, or Japan and China in the 20th, 20th century, end up defeating countries that let themselves deindustrialize. And we're letting Actually, ourselves Japan had a Japan had a robust industrial policy 40 years ago. And look at Japan now. Yeah, what, I, Where I did at, its industrial policy get it in the long run? It had a, few, it had a couple of short-term victories, and now it's, it's a mess. You can still make mistakes as, as they have and understand that it's between Japan, South Korea, and China, they're doing something different than we are, and it's working better. Yeah, some of them are failing. I, I don't know about that. I, I mean, China is, China is clearly a rising power that has had tons of potential that is laying around unused, and it has finally figured out how to harness it. How to harness it, and it's not surprising. And they're using they're using cheap currency to sell us all their stuff and gain control of major markets in the United States of important not just plastic toys but electronics and technology and all sorts of things. And not only will it make them rich, it will also engorge their military industrial complex. That's just well, the way of the world, Bob. <laughs> Uh, and you can be a free trader and say, "Oh, that's nice," and you know, you know, and, and one day you wind up and say, "Well, gee, was how, how come they they defeated us in a war?" That's that's the real the real test of a policy for not the prosperity of your country; it's whether or not you survive. Right, but I thought you were saying our problem is prosperity. No, our, 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 not the but we what we discovered belatedly in the last few years is. That the fi financialization is not, does not lead, not only does it lead to financialization, not only leads to deindustrialization, it also, also leads to impoverishment. Yeah, no, I, I think we we to some extent agree about Wall Street. It hasn't been productive. I'm not here to defend those policies at all. Um, I, I I mean, all I was saying was actually China has shown itself to be as willing as we are to participate in global governance. And uh, and, and so I know why you assume are they that they wouldn't be in the on human rights. Uh, human rights is an exception, but you know we haven't really wanted to play that game either. We refuse to join the World Criminal Court. No, no country, no country wants to be governed by foreigners. Period. Well, no, that's not what global governance is, Jim. The WTO is an example of something that's not being governed by foreigners. It actually has real effect. It actually takes real trade disputes and keeps them from becoming major tariff wars. It has happened, and it's, it's you know so it can happen. But these are early days. I will say, and we get back, we started on my book, Non-Zero. What I said was either we will develop uh, sy effective systems of global mm -hmm. governance or it may be very dark times indeed. And that's where you and I differ. You don't, you don't think that's where salvation lies. Um, and I do. But I still don't understand where you think it does lie if your view, if your view is so <laughs> apocalyptic and you don't where, think. Where it, where it lies is, is what I've always said, which is going to space. The, the okay. world is getting smaller and more dangerous, and no but that's not salvation. No, yeah, absolutely. that's a life raft for one percent of humanity. No, less than be, that, be, it could be as life raft for as many people as one as, as as long. And if we could get a space elevator going, for example, we could put lots of people up there, and you'd be draining away the most adventurous, obnoxious, cantankerous. Well, there's you know, definitely some people I want to send there. Right. So there's, look, it, it's. You're, you're not the reality of a big world of, from a small world to the big population and lots of dangerous technology is only, only going to get worse as time goes by. You're not going to settle it by papering over national yeah, but, tensions. But and why with, wouldn't with they, why wouldn't the fundamentally human problems that threaten to blow up the world and that you want and, and are the reason you want some some part of humanity to escape the world? Why wouldn't they reappear wherever humanity they, shows they up? They would, but we'd be compartmentalized. What you said? What different? What do you want to? How do you want to compartmentalize this? Different is, religions is, is, in different is, space is, is capsules, Earth, or the Earth blew up. We saw the Moon, or Mars, or Titan, or so just keep spreading and spreading and spreading and try to. It's like well, trying that, to run from a forest that's, that's, fire. That's, that's the story of the world. America is a happier place because we're not living in Europe or Africa. Yeah, but right? We didn't escape. We are fundamentally and deeply engaged with Europe economically and otherwise. It wasn't, it wasn't like moving we to another planet. Escaped. We escaped. This pilgrims escaped. Not in the sense right. you escape if you move to another planet, Jim, because we it, are it, economically it, intertwined relative with them. Relative to things back then, they totally escaped. It was, three, it was a three-month trip and, and it was an, that's, what they, that's what they did. They escaped. The, the people going to the, the Western frontier were escaping. Uh, they, yeah, they were Europe, not, Europe didn't blow up. Europe's as nice a place to live as America. But they didn't think so. In well, they were wrong. They were wrong. 
Well, because okay. Europe turned out to be just thought, about the same as America. They, they, they wanted to get away from religious persecution and religious wars and, and everything else, and kings and queens, and create a new country. I, I applaud them for doing that. Just I applaud the Americans for rebelling against Britain, which wasn't a bad country, but still, I'm glad we rebelled against them. It in the in the long run, every place becomes confining and constricting, and if you don't have a long term outlet for letting them go somewhere else, they will turn on themselves and turn on each other and kill each other. Okay, and so that, yeah. that that's that that's just that's just so elemental as to how peoples flourish by expanding and getting away from old enemies. Now, Jim, we've been doing this an hour, so we're going to have to call it to a close. I'm glad we we've, we've touched the fundamental Pinkerton bases here and wound up in outer space. But <laughs> why? I, my question is, why don't you write this book? Your your worldview is so distinctive; it really is. Do you know anybody else really? Who agrees with you on all this stuff? And if so, would you notify local authorities, please? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, um, what can I say I'll, I'll, I'll get to it. You know, just, uh, I'm not kidding, man. Okay. But maybe I'll just be a bunch of dialogue. Maybe I'll the book, the book of the future won't be the book anyway. It'll just be dialogues with no, with, no. With, Writing with, is more liberal, efficient. Liberal straight men. Writing is more efficient to access than video, notwithstanding the Dingle Link technology that we pioneered. Uh, <laughs> Damn. <laughs> yeah. So, but anyway, Jim, thank you for another another year of, uh, of, of being Jim. Something, uh, as far as I know, only you can do. <laughs> and I, I wish you and yours a happy new year. Thanks too. You too. Happy new Happy New Year to you. And thanks for thanks for thanks for thanks for thinking of me. And uh, thanks Happy New Year to all the Blogging Head fans out there. Ditto. All right. Take care. Okay. Thanks, Bob. All right, See bye. ya.